Thank you for joining us for our May Arkansas Valley Audubon Society program. I'm Megan Wilbar, museum coordinator for the InfoZone Museum at the Rawlings Library. We're fortunate to have Mark Aker, also known as Ratto, joining us tonight to guide us through the fundamentals of butterfly identification. Ratto has been learning about butterflies for many years and leads butterfly trips annually in Colorado and New Mexico. He is an artist and owns the John Doe Art Gallery and has painted publication covers and created all the illustrations for the Colorado Breeding Bird Atlas. He is an avid birder and lends his skills in seasonal bird surveys. He will be answering questions at the end, so please type them into the chat box. Dr. Peg Rooney is also joining the slide this evening. She's president of the Arkansas Valley Audubon Society and the creator for this series of monthly programs. Thank you, Peg, for your continued efforts to bring us great content, and I'll turn it over to you now. All right, thanks, Megan. I want to welcome you all here tonight and remind you that it is spring migration season. Um, millions of birds are flying over Colorado at night. And so Audubon is supporting the Lights Out Colorado Initiative, wherein we ask you as homeowners to turn off your lights at night. Uh, birds get confused by the light. They're drawn into the light. It throws them off their migratory path. It confuses them, and it makes them more prone to collisions with buildings and houses. So to help birds, turn off your lights at night until the end of May. Another way you can help birds is to join the Arkansas Valley Audubon Society. Uh, membership information is on our website, Southern Colorado Birds, abbreviated SOCO, so socobirds.org. And now I'll turn it over to Rattle. Okay, welcome. We're going to, I gave this program a couple years ago. Um, and, and we're, we're going to run through the same thing. So consider it a review. The thing about butterflies is they disappear in the winter and I have to relearn some of them every year. So I need to review myself. But I do want to give it the fundamentals of butterfly identifying. It takes good field guides for one thing. And, and there are many butterfly field guides out there, but there are two I recommend. And, and the foremost one is the Kaufman field guide which I don't have a good picture of the cover because my granddaughter put stickers on it. But the Kaufman field guides are, are very good guides for, for insects, mammals. It's a good series of field guides and, and it is all the butterflies of North America. And, and they all, it's, it's a book that fits in your pocket. The other one I recommend is Butterflies Through Binoculars. And this is Butterflies Through Binoculars, the West. And so you, if you're going to travel, you need one for the West and the East. The Kaufman Advantage is it's got all of them. The thing about butterflies, uh, as opposed to birds, birds tend to wander and migrate more. The range maps in these books generally are where the butterfly is found. You know, there are some tropical migrants that come during certain times of the year, but mostly the range maps are pretty accurate. And, and where to look for butterflies, the, the first slide we're showing is one of, one of the trips I lead, this is, we're in Sugar Ride State Park in New Mexico. Um, butterflies like mud, so we're all standing over mud. And as, as you can see on this trip, we've got some kids with nets, and we do on that trip allow netting. We just look at them through the nets. But the other, the other thing you need is close, fo uh, close focus binoculars or somebody with a big camera like, like the guy, like Cliff Smith standing there. And these are all what I'm going to be showing are all slides done by Cliff and Pearl Smith, and there's some fantastic photographs. And uh, you can see by Cliff's camera that they get them. Pearl's up on the bridge taking that shot of us down there, looking in the mud for butterflies. Now, butterflies like mud. They also like uh, rotten fruit. If you want to attract them, they like flowers, especially native plants. You want to plant native plants because the host plants that they put their caterpillars on, those are really necessary. And it's been a tough time for butterflies lately because of the drought, so there haven't been as many plants. The other thing they're attracted to is, is uh, uh, poop on, on trails. You know, you'll find them there getting salts out of the mud and salts out of the uh, scat. But, but, uh, but we'll move on from there to the next slide. And this is the Colorado State Insect, the official Colorado State Insect, which is the Colorado hair streak. And... Uh, We'll, we'll get more into, into looking at that. But what I'm going to be doing with these, these slides you see is I'm going to generally follow the field guides, how the butterflies are in the field guides. And uh, 
There's my field guide. Okay, so we'll go next. Next. Okay, the swallowtail family is 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 in the front of the book, and they're they're probably the largest butterflies you'll see flying through your yard. And and in Colorado and Pueblo County, we have two tiger swallowtails. We have the western tiger swallowtail and the two-tailed swallowtail. And and the difference you can tell when when you're watching these two fly through your yard is the Western tiger swallowtail has thicker black stripes on its wings. We'll go to the next one. Now these are pretty thick stripes, but as you can see, the fly might have two tails out here. It's, it's really, by the wind. That, that butterfly's lived a long life. We'll go to the next slide here. Oh, back one. <clears throat> back, back one, back two more. Okay, there. Now this is this is the two-tailed swallowtail. It has thinner stripes, and as you can see it's got two tails on, on each lower wing. So it's actually got four tail. Go to the next slide here. But those are thinner stripes than the Western tiger swallowtail. Here you can kind of see on the bottom wing, the two, two tails on each, each wing. Okay, go on. Next. This is the other common large swallowtail. And these are fist size butterflies. And this is the black swallowtail. You'll see this in your garden quite commonly in Pueblo. Next. This is an, another view of the black swallowtail with its wings open. And that's a pretty healthy, it's a pretty fresh butterfly on, on Rocky Mountain bee plant. Next. Reto, I'm having trouble hearing you is why I'm messing up so much. Um, do you have a microphone? Oh, okay. that or closer, Let me turn just up. so I don't mess up. <laughs> Let me turn up my uh, volume here just in case. Does that do better? I can hear you a little bit better. Okay, I'll, I'll get a little closer here. Okay, <laughs> Thank there, you. Okay, now we'll go to the next slide. Okay, this is the pike vine swallowtail, which is another large dark swallowtail, but it's not nearly as common as the black swallowtail. Next. And this is this is the pipe vine swallowtail with its wings closed up and has that beautiful distinct pattern on its lower wing. Next. Okay, and this is the largest swallowtail in the swallowtail family. And it's called the giant swallowtail. And and it's it's a wanderer up up in the eastern Colorado. Cliff got this shot at the Nature Center in Pueblo. I've never seen one in Colorado, but but Cliff was there with his camera when this one showed up. And on the next slide, you'll you'll see a little bit more about this one. This is with its wings open, but you can see it's had a difficult journey here because it's got its lower wings are, are missing, which could have been a predator, it could have been the wind, could have been anything. It's just it's it's nearing the end of its cycle there. Next. This is in the swallowtail family also. This is the Phoebus parnissian. They, you have to go up into the higher elevations in Pueblo County to find this one, find them along stream beds and, and on hilltops. But it's, it's a pretty unique butterfly. But it's, it's also a white, which brings us into the next category, it's the next slide. This is the cabbage white, and, and the whites are another family of butterfly. And this is the, probably the most common butterfly you find in Pueblo County right now. It's actually, it's, it's, its origin is Europe, probably where they grew cabbage, but, but it, you'll, you'll see it in a lot of waste areas around here. And, and you'll notice that that lower wing is kind of yellowish. It's got that one spot on it. So that, that identifies it as a, I think that's a male, yeah. Okay, next slide.
Yeah, this is this is a con conflagration of males. They all have the one spot on their wing, but those are all cabbage whites, loving the dandelions. There's nothing wrong with dandelions in your yard either because the butterflies like them. Okay, next. This is a white, that's probably the next most common white around here, the checkered white. And it's got kind of a checkered pattern on it. Next. Okay, that one's not coming up yet. Okay, this is a checkered white with its wings opened. And it's a little faded. Sometimes they, they have much more striking pattern. Next. And this is this is a female checkered white that's pretty striking right now. So so there's a little difference in pattern in males and females, and not all butterflies have the difference in pattern between male and females, but, but some of them do. You kind of got to get used to learning that too. Next. <clears throat> yeah, that one's not coming up. Sorry, Rado, there's some serious lag time between when I click it. Oh, okay. So, sorry to, to keep you waiting there. <laughs> well, I'll do a song and dance while we're waiting. <laughs> yeah. There, well, there this, it goes. This is the checkered white with its wings folded up. And go next. Now, there's uh, some question about how butterflies got their names, or why are they called butterflies? And, and there's mixed information on the internet. You know, one being maybe they were attracted to butter. Uh, there are large yellow butterflies. And one, one thing we found out is that it's, uh, they attributed to the color of their excrement, which isn't very romantic. But I'm not a butterfly poop expert, so I'm not sure what color they are. <laughs> but this is another checkered white right here on, on rabbit brush. If you have rabbit brush in your neighborhood, that's really good for butterflies for nectaring. Next. We do have one question if you want to answer in between. Okay, yeah. I'll um, what, questions. And maybe you answered part of it. Are what plants attract butterflies besides rabbit brush? Well, any plant with flowers attracts them for nectaring, <laughs> but you want to, in, in the field guides, it will tell you what their host plants are. And their host plants are the plants that they lay their eggs on, and the caterpillars will eat those plants. So you want to have a lot of those planted in your yard too. And then you want to leave those little wormy caterpillar things there because they'll be butterflies okay and this this butterfly is in the white family also you'll notice the little orange on it but the real heavily veined pattern this is a pine white and usually i only see these at the tops of pine trees flying up there but cliff got this nice shot on, a, on an aster which is you know a beautiful shot it came down to the flower which I've never had them do that for me, so it's a pretty remarkable shot. Next. It's coming. And so. Did we lose you, Rado? Okay, now we've got a, a slide with, with, with the, uh, this is rabbit brush, but we've got the, the uh, female cabbage white with the two dots. And then the yellow one on the right is the most common sulfur you'll find. The sulfurs are all the yellow butterflies. 
and this is this is the orange sulfur. Next. And this is an orange sulfur. We're going to go through a lot of beautiful orange sulfur shots because they're the most common sulfur around. But they have that pattern on their wings with the rings and the dots. Next. This is a real fresh one. And this is a male. I can tell just by the the row, the, the edge on the on the edge of it has a single row if it opens up and the female has a double row of, of black. Next. And there's another real fresh orange sulfur. Next. And that's a female. You can on the on the outer edge of the wings. You can see that there's 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 a, a row of yellow dots in between the row of black there, where the male is just solid black. Next. Next, that's still another orange sulfur. So. <clears throat> so you've seen a lot of pictures of the orange sulfur, so hopefully you'll be able to identify those. There, if you're near an alfalfa field, another name for them is alfalfa butterfly. Go ahead, and next one. And, and they are attracted to alfalfa. So you'll see thousands of them over. If you go east of Pueblo in the alfalfa fields, you'll see thousands of those orange sulfurs. Now this one that's under wing is different. You know, it's kind of greenish and it's got that one faded white spot. That's the Queen Alexandra sulfur. Next. And it's on a nap. Nope, oh, that's back to the Queen Alexandra. Next. Okay, th this one's a little different. Um, I think the next slide is even the same butterfly. Let's see if it comes up again. Got that lag time, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah, some seem to take longer than others. So. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> okay, and this is this is the same butterfly. It's on a juniper, but this is called the sleepy orange. But it's got that real kind of bark, leaf-like underwing and if it opens its wing has a yellow to orange cast and they have a real sleepy droopy flight next i think this next slide is, is cliff uh with one that's, that's a sleepy orange that, it, that is open and that's a milkweed milk milkweed is really a good native plant for for a lot of nature especially butterflies and bees next and during the lag time a lot of people ask about the difference between moths and butterflies so i'll get on to that but now if you're walking along a trail around pueblo kind of in a waste area that you'll see a little dime-sized butterfly and it's the smallest of the sulfurs and it's called the dainty sulfur and that's what this is it's a real tiny yellow butterfly next Yeah, okay, and that's a dainty sulfur on a flower. They, they do have a distinct pattern, but the main thing is they're really tiny. And it's really the only tiny one around here. And you can see how tiny it is by that soldier beetle right next to it on that flower. Next. Yeah, so, so moths and butterflies Butterflies all have knobs on their antenna. That's one way to tell them apart. The other thing they say is they, they fly in the daytime where moths don't. There are exceptions to that. And, and I also notice butterflies have a, have a less uh, floppy flight than moths. Now we're getting into another family of butterflies. And you'll note on the lower wing, there's kind of a fake eye spot and a fake antenna. And, and this is the hair streak family. This is a banded hair streak, I believe. And this is one cliff shot i don't believe i've ever seen one but cliff obviously found one somewhere next this next one is the most common one in your garden 
and, and I've had them in my garden this year. When they're flying around, they look like a little blue butterfly, but it's actually called the gray hair streak. And you'll see its big fake orange eye and the fake antenna, and that's for predators to, they'll go after that part of the wing and leave the, uh, the, the real vulnerable eye and head alone. And, and you'll find a lot of butterflies with, with fake eye spots as we go through this program. Next. There's another look at the gray hair streak on clover. You can get an idea of the size. They're, they're fairly tiny, maybe nickel sized. Next. And that's the gray hair streak with its wings open. It's, it's a pretty dull butterfly when its wings open. I think it's a little more spectacular in flight and uh, getting that blue cast from the underwing. Next. Okay, this we're back to the uh, official state insect, which is the Colorado hair streak. And it's got a pretty spectacular set of fake antenna and eye spots. But as we go through this next series of slides, you'll, you'll see why it was why, why it became the Colorado state insect. Next. And you can see it opening up how, how beautiful it is. Next. It's that orange and, and deep blue. You know, it's, it is a beautiful insect. That the guy I learned most of my butterflies from is Steve Carey. He's he's in New Mexico Parks, retired state naturalist. And uh, first time I encountered him was watching him on PBS, and he was mentioning this butterfly as being the holy grail of butterflies in New Mexico. Now they're quite common in Pueblo County, especially if you get up in the Pueblo Mountain Park at certain times of year. Their host plant is Gamble's Oak. Next. This one might be a longer lag. So there was a question is what is the okay. lifespan of a butterfly? Okay, well, the lifespan it kind of varies because um, well, well, I'll get to that question on the next right. lag too, since we've got it. Okay, this <laughs> is this is milkweed again with a little little hair streak on it. This is the juniper hair streak. I see these out by Pueblo Reservoir quite often. So their host plant is juniper, but they they got that beautiful greenish cast to them. So go to the next one too. And as far as lifespan of butterflies, there's there's another good look at that hair streak. It's got got the fake eyes and the antenna. Okay, before, so I'll finish. This is, this is also in the hair streak family and it's probably difficult to see this little butterfly. And it is little, but you can see the ponderosa pine needles there around it, but, but it's, it's an elfin. And I first identified this as a pine elfin, but I believe it's a hairy, a hoary elfin. Um, it's, those are the two elfins around, but, but they're real dainty little brown butterflies. Next. But as far as their life, okay. Now we're 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 and I'll, I'll continue answering the question about the lifespan because through the lifespan of this program too. But this now we're earning a new family. It's called these are the blues. But if you can take a close look at this, and this is probably a dime-sized blue but it also has a little fake antenna and a, and a fake eyeball on its lower wing. Not nearly as prominent, so I've misidentified this one several times, and it's usually when we see the photos, and you go to the next slide, that we find out, oh, this was the, this was the, uh, the western tailed blue. And here he is with his wings open, but you can see the little fake antenna on there. And, and uh, most of the blues have that blue cast on the inside and when you when you want to try to identify them, you want to wait around till they close up their wings because it's the underwing that usually is the key to identifying them. Go ahead to the next. And yeah, there are certain certain butterflies that will overwinter that will will uh, 
get in pine bark and, and manage to survive the winter and you'll often see them come out in February. So, so they'll do a season, but then there, there are butterflies like, like the monarchs in their migration. They'll have three life cycles to complete their migration from Mexico up to Canada. So, so you'll have three, gener three or four generations of butterflies making that migration and then one swoop back. So, um, so yeah, it really varies, but, but uh, once they're in the butterfly form, their life is, is you know, they're, they're, the object is to breed and lay eggs. Their, their longer life is as a caterpillar. So, but, but now, we're, now we're, in, we're into the blues, and you can see this one has eye spots, no tail. It's got a real pattern to it. And go to the next one. I found a butterfly in, in uh, February once, and I I asked uh, one of the authors of one of the, the Peterson Field Guide, Paul Opler, who is a real expert on butterflies, whether they wintered over. And he said, well, I'm not sure. And I said, well, I saw one in February. And he said, well, then they winter over. So, and here's your marine blue. But see, it's, it's, it's the only blue around here that has that distinct zebra-like pattern in its wings. Next one. So there's still a lot to learn about butterflies and, and just getting out and observing them. Some of these slides we've got of butterflies aren't officially recognized as Pueblo County butterflies because they haven't been entered with the right um, butterfly people. And here's the marine blue with its wings open. It's not nearly as spectacular blue. I think the males have are more blue, but you can still see that distinct pattern next. And there is a website, uh, Butterflies of North America, that Paul Opler oversees that you can learn a lot by looking at that website. Do they have an app that you can use to identify butterflies? They, like they probably do, you know. I just, I'm an old school, so I'm a field boy. Right. <laughs> Okay, so this is the tiniest butterfly in North America, and it is a blue, but you can see the distinct patterning, the orange on the upper wing, the uh, dots on the lower wing. This is the Western Pygmy Blue, and it's, it's less than dime size, and it's, it's a very tiny, tiny butterfly. You'll see the ra rabbit brush blooms in late summer and fall, and that's usually when I find the Western Pygmy Blues, too, is, is late summer and fall, but they're quite common around Pueblo at that time of year. But they are very tiny. You'll think you're just looking at a fly. But if you, if you wait till they land, you might find out you're looking at a butterfly. Next. Yeah, there are, there are a lot of uh, apps like iNaturalist where you can put in things to have them identified. Like I say, I'm pretty old school. I'll, I'll use the books. Now, here's another tiny, tiny butterfly, not quite as tiny as the Western Pygmy Blue. You can see it has eye spot on the bottom wing. And as I'm describing these, you'll see a lot of these butterflies hang upside down. But then it's got those dots on the upper wing. And this this is the Rhea Kurtz Blue. And then the next series of shots are, are going to be all the Rhea Kurtz Blue. Next. I feel like you've mentioned a lot of smaller butterflies or I didn't realize there were so many that were smaller than a like dime size. Yeah, you... that's that's what I've learned leading butterfly trips. People don't realize, yeah, a lot of the butterflies you're gonna see are very, very tiny. Hmm. And uh, you know, once you start noticing them, you see them everywhere. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but but it's a matter of And there of is a question to too of, of why do butterflies okay. hang upside down? Um I'm not sure I can answer that. They might be nectaring. <laughs> they they uh, they just go in all kinds of forms, and and you see a lot of the upside down ones have been on flowers. So it must be the way they're nectaring. Oh, okay. This is the rear Kurtz blue with its wing open. You can see something got to its upper wing, so it's mm -hmm. it's nearing the end of its cycle. Next, and that was just a blade of grass that that butterfly was on. So you can see how tiny they can be. Yeah. Now in the in the late summer, well actually in fall, 
I'll see some fist-sized yellow butterflies that aren't supposed to be in Colorado. They're migrants. That the uh, large orange sulfur that I found in November in my yard, and they're they're fist-sized bright yellow butterfly. One of the bigger ones. But this is this is a uh, another tiny little blue, kind of an indistinct pattern. The little arrow things on the edge of its wings. And this is the spring azure. And, and when you get into the butterfly book, they call it the spring azure complex because there's a lot of variation on them. But they are one of the first blues you find in the spring. Next. And as I told Megan before this, when I do this program live, I can use my laser pointer to point things out. But, yeah, and I'm, I'm no match for you with the mouse, <laughs> yeah, so, especially when they won't load. So. But it is my, my opportunity to have fun with a laser pointer, so I'm kind of missing live programs. <laughs> we might be able to get to those sometime. Well, next and, time we'll have I, it live. At Sugar Ranch State Park in New Mexico, they, they have what they call the Bodacious Butterfly Festival, and that's when I lead one of the trips. Hmm. And they're having it in mid-July this year. Usually it's at the end of June. But Steve Carey, the New Mexico expert, usually gives programs on Friday night, and then he leads field trips on Saturday. Now we're still in the blues, and you can see that distinct orange lower wing. And, and the only butterfly around Pueblo with that distinct just single orange pattern on the lower wing is the Akmon blue. Next. And these, this series is, is all of the Akmon blue. And there is some debate. Some butterfly people say this isn't the Akmon blue, it's the Lupin blue. They're, they're still debating the genetics of the blue complex, but, but most butterflies say the ones around here are Akmon blues. The Lupin blues are out in California. So. There was another question too. Will, will butterflies nectar at a hummingbird feeder? I think they will. I, I watched a, a hummingbird get chased by a butterfly away from a flower, which is kind of interesting that the butterfly was that bold. So they probably, you know, if the nectar was available, I've never actually seen it, but I, I don't doubt that they might if, if there's nothing else available. Of the Akron blue with its wings open and just see that orange pattern on the bottom of the wing. Like I say, this is, this is probably a nickel sized butterfly. Next. And yeah, the Butterfly Festival, the Bodacious Butterfly Festival, um, they won't give a program this year because of COVID, but they are going to have field trips. And Steve Carey will lead, he always leads the Saturday field trip. And I learned all my butterflying from Steve Carey. And, uh, but he told me I have to start leading my own trip. So that's why I lead the Sunday trip. And he <laughs> leads the Saturday trip. So I can't learn from him anymore. <laughs> okay, this one has a little bit pattern on the, on the lower wing. You know, it's different, and, and it's got those dots on the top. So it's different than the real Kurtz blue because of that lower wing. This is the Bois de Vol blue, or Bois de Vol. I don't know how to pronounce it in French, but we Americans call it the Bois de Vol blue. Next. And I think this, is, this next shot is one of them, too. But even with, you know, the butterflies, I have to... It's good to have a review because I have to relearn them every year, and some of them are quite confusing. It's kind of like inverting. The, the goals can be real confusing. This is another shot of the boys the ball blue. It's another tiny, tiny butterfly. And you'll find a lot of the blues next. The blues like really like mud. So if you find a muddy streamside, look for the little blues flying around. Next. Keep them go. <clears throat> the other interesting thing about the New Mexico State Park down there is it's on the border of Colorado because I, I kind of discovered that area. There's, there's a state wildlife area in Colorado, Lake Dorothy State Wildlife Area, and then Sugar Ride State Park, New Mexico is northern New Mexico. So we do make this count as a, this butterfly festival is a two-state count. You can cross the border real easy. There's the Bois Duval blue 
on a flower with a bee, so you can get an idea of the size of that. Next. Now, the, the problem I think we're going to have with our two-state count this year is, is state wildlife areas in Colorado, to access them now, you need a fishing or hunting license or a wildlife watching license. So you have to have a license to go there. Now, state parks, you have to have a parts pass. But I believe this is that same Boys of All Blue that's opening up, and you can see it, the beautiful blue in it. Next. So I finally got my fishing license so I can go into wildlife areas. That, that law took effect in July. I think this is a Bois Duval Blue too. Next. And there he is opening up. Beautiful little blue cast. Next. Okay, now this one you'll see is also a tiny blue, but you can see it's got the orange on the bottom and the orange on the top of the wings. And this this is the the only one in in Colorado with that pattern is the Melissa blue. Next, and there's there's the Melissa blue. See the orange on both wings. Next, and there's two Melissa blues. And I think they're on uh, probably cow dung, or it could be mud, but they like both. They get salts from, from both mud and, and from dung, so that's why you'll find them on those places. So they nectar at those things, too, Well, they salt at them. Next. And there, there's another shot of Melissa Blue. Next. Okay, now we're getting into another family of butterflies that can confuse me sometimes. This one doesn't. It's this is these are the fritillaries, and this this fritillary is is the Gulf fritillary, and named so because they're more common in the Gulf of Mexico, but they do wander in Colorado. Go to the next one. Oh, go back one. There it is. There it is with its wings open. Real kind of elongated upper wing. And uh, Cliff got beautiful shots of this Gulf fritillary. The only one I've seen in, in uh, well, it was in New Mexico, but it was flying over me. But this one was cooperative for Cliff or Pearl. I'm not sure who exactly took these, but I'm going to, let's just say Cliff and Pearl took all these beautiful shots. Next. Now, this is a fritillary that's probably the most common around Pueblo out in the prairie and desert area. Kind of got that that pattern of that light pattern on the upper wing, and this is this is the variegated fritillary. And this is a, probably a good time to start seeing them around here. They we're starting to get some flowers blooming on the prairie right now, so it's a good time to get out. Next, this is another shot of the variegated fritillary. It's more a fresh one, but. It's kind of got that row, that light pattern row in the wings that, you know, I've, I've learned that that helps me identify it immediately. Next. And now we're into a, a fritillary that can confuse the heck out of me sometimes. They've got this beautiful white spots when they're folded up. And these are, these are probably 50 cent size. They're a larger butterfly. And, and mostly they, they fly by real fast. And when we have those kids with nets, they never can catch them. But Cliff's able to catch them with his camera. And this is probably the Aphrodite fritillary, which is the most common. And there's, there's another fritillary around here called the Atlantis fritillary. Go to the next one, which uh, this is neither because it's got those white spots on the edge, which this makes it the Edwards fritillary, which you find up in the foothill around here. Next. I'll get back on the, the Atlantis. And...
Uh-oh, I think we lost Rado, and unfortunately, I don't know anything about um, butterflies. So I'm going to just take you through some of the some of the images until he can join. There he is. Okay, yeah. You're back. <laughs> Something's going on with the internet connection. Let's see. Go yeah, back. yeah, I think we're both having trouble. Right. Yeah. I think I zoomed ahead a little bit, so you can tell me to go yeah. back. Yeah, go back a, a couple slides at least, I think. Okay. Yeah, go back one more. We're, we're, okay, there's the Edwards Fairly. Now go forward. That's got that white on it. And go to the next one. And this one doesn't have the white. It's more orange on the tips. And this is probably an Aphrodite. I, it, the, the photo right now is pretty small to me, but the main difference between the Atlantis and the Aphrodite is the Aphrodite has brown eyes and the Atlantis fritillary has bluish gray eyes. So, so to get that, you need Cliff and Pearl with a good camera so you can see the eye color, or you actually have to try to catch them. Um, it's pretty difficult with the binoculars. Go to the next one. I think that one has the brown eyes, and this one has the blue-gray eyes. So this is this is the Atlantis fritillary. They, they look real similar, but then there's a butterfly below that that's in a different family that we'll go into. And this this is the, the crescents and checker spots are a wide-ranging family of butterflies. This is the northern crescent, and uh, and you can get a size difference. This this is more of a, a nickel nickel quarter size butterfly, probably quarter size. Next, and there are some of these flying around now to confuse me. This is the uh, pearl crescent. At least I'm pretty sure it is. Next, and you. That looks like a goldenrod there. And look at the bees flying in. That's that's an amazing shot. I think this might be Pearl's shot next. And there there it is with its wings folded up. Next. And that's how you want their wings to fold up. Go ahead. Um, to try and identify them. Let's see where I am on this one. This is... Okay, yeah, there's a lot of variations on crescents. This is probably a northern crescent go on. And here's a field crescent, a little bit different pattern, and you can see by that aster how small it is. Next. It's a pretty big family. There's a real beat up field crescent. So it's it's had a it's had a rough life, but hopefully it laid some eggs next. <laughs> There's a fresher one, so that's a real good shot. And you see it's on a clover. Nothing wrong with clover either. They'll nectar at that, so next. And here's here's a crescent folded up. And there, there's one folded up too. Next. And there's a really fresh, beautiful one, field crescent that's... Uh, that's that's really a, that's a nice fresh one that's got got a lot a lot to look forward to. There's another shot of it too on an aster. This is my only photograph, and this is the only time I found this. This is in my studio that was out back in the parking lot. It's a gorgon checker gorgon checker spot is what this is, and that's my hand. <laughs> it was probably near the end of its life. This was this was fall. When I found him, next. So you can see my photography is not nearly as aesthetic as uh, <laughs> Pearl and Cliffs. Yeah. Now we're into another family of butterflies. Uh, these are these are what I call the punctuation marks, and this this is a comma. Is what it's called, and and because on the lower wing, I don't know if you can see this on this shot, but but you'll see the little thin white thing that looks like a comma, and that's why it's called that. Yeah. And this, yeah, this is folded up, and so I'm identifying this one as a satyr comma. It's got that real uh, leafy look to it when they fold up. But th there's another one that Cliff and Pearl don't have a shot of that has that that comma pattern, and this got a dot on it, and that's the question mark. Hmm. And it's it's very similar. It's got a, it's brighter brighter red on the inside. But I have those in my yard quite commonly, so I'm really surprised that Pearl and Cliff don't have a good shot of a question mark. 
They probably do somewhere, but I, I, I'm going to have to get it next. And here's here's the the comma with its wings open. Real uh, variegated pattern on the outer wing which makes it makes it look like a when it's folded up, it looks like an old leaf that you want to leave alone. Next. And this is the other comma. You can see the white on this is darker. Um, this is the hoary comma. And you can see that little comma on that lower wing. Next. There he is opening up. So yeah, when they fold those wings up, they disappear. That's that's the amazing thing about them. Next. There's, there's another shot of them. You can see the, the comma pretty clearly in this slide. Next. Now this one is doesn't have a punctuation mark, but it's it's real dull, kind of blends into those rocks. You think there's an old leaf there, but the next shot will show you something else. That's with its wings open. And that's the Milbert's tortoise shell. And, and there's nothing else like it. That one I can identify real easy, at least when they open their wings up. And that's the one that I saw in February that I asked Paul Opler whether they wintered over. And he said, well, if you saw it in February, I guess they do. So, so they'll, they'll, they look like bark and they'll get into wood piles and manage to survive the winter. Next. And this is another one that winters over too. This, and willow is their host plant. But I, I'm starting to see quite a few of these coming around. This is the morning cloak. And it has that distinct yellow white edge. And, and then the next one, you'll see how yellow that edge really is sometimes. And uh, when they fold up, they look like bark too. But, but uh, when they're unfolded, you can't miss them. Next. This one is the red admiral. And it's also another one I see quite commonly in my garden at home. With that distinct orange pattern through it. And these are fairly large butterflies, both the morning cloaks and they're they're silver dollar sized. I'm making all these references to money, so I think that's the easiest way to do it. Go ahead next. And there's another one of the Red Admiral, and you know, they have these in Europe and England too. So I was able to identify one butterfly in England when I was there next. And here's the other admiral that we have around here. And you want to go up into the foothills and mountains to see this one. This is the Wiedemeyer's admiral. And, and there's, you know, it's very distinct with that. And it's a large butterfly with that, that wide white pattern. Next. And there, there he is with his wings folded up. And it's, it's just as spectacular that way, but. They do tend to disappear more when they fold up. But that's the Wiedemeyer's Admiral. And there's there's nothing else like that around here. Okay, this poor butterfly on the clover is probably one a couple of years ago there were thousands of these everywhere. And we're into the, the ladies right now. And you'll see on the outer wings of the upper wing, you'll see that the white pattern that's there's large white dot and then there's little dots on the outer part. That's kind of key to the two ladies or the three ladies we have around here. And we'll go to the next one. And this is a fresh one. This is the painted lady. But I, I wouldn't positively identify this butterfly as a painted lady. I mean, there are little patterns that you could identify, but you want to wait till it folds up its wings next. And and on this, this is the painted lady with its wings folded up. And you'll see on the lower wing, there are four eye spots. And that's that's what distinctly identifies that as the painted lady. Like I say, a couple seasons ago, there are thousands of these everywhere. Right now, we're not seeing them. Partly the droughts probably hurt a lot of butterflies lately. Next. Now this is the other lady and you can see it's got on its lower wing, it's got just two, but they're large eye spots. And that, that makes this the American lady. I'm not sure what's American about it, but except it's got big eyes. Next. And there, there's another look at the American lady, but you see those two, two large eye spots on that lower wing. Otherwise, when their wings are open, they look pretty similar. Next. 
that one's got the two large eye spots too next the american lady now this one's open and this this one is the other lady that shows up in late summer and fall around here but it doesn't have when its wings are open it doesn't have that large white spot towards the outer wing it's just got the little tiny white spots but the large spot on this one is orange instead of white and that makes this butterfly the west coast lady i don't know if they show up here from the west coast or what but now they're just here they're a late summer one for me i've seen a lot of these on the west coast they're not quite as common here okay there's your west coast lady next so those are the ladies now we got some eye spots and the spectacular orange spots on it this is this is the common buckeye and i'll see this any time of the season i'll see these but when you do see them you can't miss them next yeah that's that's the common buckeye with its with its wings open but that distinct orange and white and those beautiful eye spots next i guess that yeah that that's confusing me but i think that's a common buckeye too okay yeah next i see the orange on it it's hiding its eye spots a little more Okay, come on butterflies. When you're, oh, the other thing butterflies do like that, that is pretty necessary is, is you need um, hot sunshine. I'll get more into that. Okay, now we've got one of the mimics and, and you might be familiar with the monarchs. They're large orange butterflies. This is the monarch mimic. This is the viceroy. And, and the difference between the monarch and the viceroy is on the lower wings, you'll see that line through it. And the monarchs are the milkweed butterflies. This one doesn't, doesn't uh, host on milkweed, so it's not poisonous, so it mimics the monarch. Next. So then birds avoid it, because they've learned to avoid monarchs. And this is the viceroy. You can see that on that lower wing, that, that spot, that, that line through it, that identifies it as the viceroy. Next. Okay, here's another orange one that's large that, that uh, some years I see a few of these and some years I don't see them at all. It's called the goatweed leafwing. And its host plant must be goatweed, whatever that is. But it's, it's a spectacular orange butterfly when it opens up and go to the next one. And this is what happens when it folds up its wings. It disappears as a leaf. But when it opens, it's just got that spectacular, and it's got a real leaf shape to it, but it's got that spectacular orange when it opens up. I've seen these up in the foothills and at, in Pueblo, so, but not, not real common. Next. Yeah, the thing, this is, this is another one that I see kind of regularly around here that the, the uh, Hackberry Emperor, and that's the only emperor around. We're kind of getting into royalty here, though, being an emperor. So we'll go to the next. Because now we're getting into the monarch. And we'll go to the next slide, which, as it's, so you can see on the monarch, that it's got that heavily veined pattern, but it doesn't have that line through the lower wing. It's just got the veins. So that that is a monarch, and it, its host plant is milkweed, so birds will avoid that butterfly. Next. So we got the monarch, and there's a monarch, and you see that lower wing. And this is rabbit brush. This is this is the monarch's southern journey. They come through when the rabbit brush is blooming. You'll see monarchs in a lot of places in the fall. Next. <clears throat> This is the other royalty you'll find around here. Not, not as heavily veined as the monarch. This is the queen. Next. And these are all large butterflies, so. So they're hard to miss when they're around. 
But like I say, butterflies want want sunshine. They just when when the cloud cover comes, they just seem to disappear. So that's why you know, as a bird watcher, we can go to the next. I uh, in the summer when when uh, birds are nesting, there's the queen, not heavily veined. That's another good view of the queen. Okay, next. I started looking at butterflies because the, the birds in the heat of the day kind of disappear, but the butterflies come out. And this this is a, another family of butterflies. These are these are the, uh, the the satyrs. This is the common wood nymph, and it's just kind of a dull brown, but it's got that distinct eye spot. If you get further east of here, the eye spots are a little different, but but this is the one around here, the common wood nymph. And there's a, there's another one around here that's a smaller wood nymph too. Okay, next. And this this is a wood nymph also. Um, I think this is one that hasn't been officially put on the Pueblo butterfly list, but we find these quite regularly up in Pueblo Mountain Park. It's got that that eye spot, but then it's got that orange cast on the upper wing. This is the Meads wood nymph. Go ahead on the next few slides, and you can. You can see why why they like Pueblo Mountain Park. There, there's another good look at it with the eye spots in that orange cast on the thistle. Next. But this is where it blends in with that. It just blends so perfectly in with the ponderosa pine bark. There is a butterfly in there. The needs wood nymph. So next. And there there he is right there. You can see that eye spot. But but it sure looks like the bark. And this this is another kind of related. This is the the common ringlet, and you know it's got a different pattern. It doesn't have that as dull on the lower wing, but it's got it's got that eye spot and that orange cast. It's a little bit smaller than the Meads wood nymph, but it's got a real lazy, floppy flight, kind of like a moth when you see these coming up. So next, that's the common ringlet. Now this one, you have to go a little higher in the mountains in, in, in Pueblo County to get this. This is the common alpine. And uh, I, I've seen one of these up by San Isabel. And I'm not sure where Cliff got that shot, but it's, it's, kinda, it's kind of a neat looking butterfly. Now we're getting into the, towards the end of the book, we're getting into the skippers. And skippers, when they, they fold up their wings different than the other butterflies, they kind of have a swept back look. But this is this is the largest skipper, and it has a real large proboscis. So, so it it likes the same flowers that butterflies like. But this this is the silver spotted skipper. And I think that lower wing is the silver spot on it. But it's it's a fairly large skipper. Next, and there's there's another view of the silver spotted skipper. Next, and this this is a. A fairly dull uh, in that the skipper family. This is a cloudy wing, a northern cloudy wing. See more. It's got. See how they sweep sweep their wings back more. Next, and and some of these can get quite confusing. I get confused with them all the time. So next, there we're going. There's there's another look at it. Now this this one is the Rocky Mountain dusky wing. With his wings open, it's pretty dull when its wings closed up, but but that it's kind of got a pretty brown pattern to it. Next, and these are pretty common up in the foothills and up in there's a there's a good view of a fresh Rocky Mountain dusky wing. Next, and this one is the most common one around Pueblo. You find these in your gardens and in. Hollow and but this is this is the checkered skipper. You can go to the next. And and as you see these flying around in your garden, you think it might be a blue because it's some of them some of them have that blue cast to their body. But that distinct checkered black and white pattern. They're they're about a quarter sized to nickel sized butterfly. Next. But yeah, I see these, and there's another look at one. And there's another another look at one on on an aloe. 
And there's one with its wings folded up on a clover. Next. Okay, now we're into uh, back to this skipper family, which is still part of this, but this is a very dull one that's called a dun skipper, which I think is aptly named. But we find these quite commonly in, in uh, Pueblo Mountain Park when we have the butterfly trips up there. Next. And you see the swept back wings of these guys. You know, it's not commonly kind of folded up. They, they sweep them back different. Next. That's another look at one with its wings swept back. Next. They're pretty, pretty tiny, and there's a lot of different ones. You find a lot of these at mud. Here's an orangey one, and there, there are a lot of different orange skippers, so you can kind of go crazy trying to identify them sometimes. This is the most common one around here is a taxili skipper, and uh, it's one I can, I'm learning to identify and to try, instead of trying to call it other things. But you see the size of that clover flower, how tiny that one is too. Next. And there's a lot of skippers that like grasses. That's another view of a taxili skipper. Next. Of course, that might not be. I'll have to I'll have to research that one a little better. Next. There we go again with one. Looks like he's on a lichen or moss or something. Okay, next. Okay, you've been through the field guide. You've looked at 145 slides. I hope you can wake up now. We'll take some questions. Um, I see you, you have. You mind me asking, what's the butterfly there. often confused with a monarch? That's the viceroy. That's the one we we looked at that has that line that through the the lower wing. Yeah, and that's and to confuse the birds, the predators. Yeah, and then we had another question of. Um, butterflies gravitate to mud. Why do they do that? Yeah, that's because of the salts in the mud. They'll, mm -hmm. they'll actually put their little proboscis down in the mud and get salts out and some water too, probably. Yeah. That's okay. One more. Um, what plants should we plant okay. to attract butterflies and hummingbirds? Right. Well, any any plant that, uh, that that they'll nectar at, but but any you know, I'm I'm an advocate of plant all the native plants you can, especially ones that flower. Uh, there are butterfly weeds and stuff you can plant to you'll attract them for nectaring, and uh, some of the salsify not the salsify but uh, there, there are you know the red anything well butterflies are. Hummingbirds will go to anything red. So if you plant the red flower, you're going to attract butterfly or hummingbirds. But but you know the reason I say native plants, you want to plant the plants that they're going to host on too. That's that's what does better for their species. So so if you want to keep monarchs going, plant milkweed in your garden. But any but any native plants, I'm, I'm a real advocate of that. Oh. Thank you, Rado. This has been very informative. I, I didn't know there were so many butterflies. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'll let you go. Um, yeah, well, we only touched on part of them, so. <laughs> yeah. Can people find you at John Doe uh, Gallery to ask you more questions? Yes, they can. And, and like <laughs> I say, check the website of the Audubon Society because we'll be leading a trip up in Pueblo Mountain Park sometime this summer. And look at the website of New Mexico State Parks to see when the trip is at uh, Sugar Rite State Park. That's great. And, and you can thank learn you. a lot on those. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks. Good night. Mm -hmm.